Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Quandaries and Sundries, where we cover the science and history news of the week and hopefully expand your knowledge, or at least give you a break from all the craziness of your day to day. I hope you all had a great week and a great Valentine's Day, and if not, I hope I can help soothe your worry and anxiety, because this week we have some fascinating stories to tell. So sit right back and get comfortable and let us get right into our main stories of the week. Let us start off this week with a trip back to our own planet's oceans. Last week we talked about noise pollution and its impact on sea life and how it disrupts their daily functions and survival. But when I read a new story this week, I thought I would expand on last week's segment by talking more about whale calls. I previously said how whales use deep sonar-like sounds to communicate long distances, but I forgot to mention about how their calls can map the environment around them in the same way a bat's echolocation can. Just like how I said dolphins can see where they are going with sound. Well, what if I told you that we could use their own built-in sonar for our own benefit and use it to map the sea floor? Currently, we have only been able to map about 20 to 30 percent of our oceans, an impossible feat because of its massive size, lack of light, and intense pressure the deeper we go. My favorite ever example of what these pressures would be like comes from the YouTube channel Real Life Lore, where he said that if you were about 20,000 feet down or about 6,000 meters, the pressure would be so heavy it would be like an elephant standing on a postage stamp. Some would call this ridiculous, over-exaggerated for content, but the more one investigates the pressure at such a depth, it becomes a true example and a scary one at that. It makes one respect the life that live at such depths and had to evolve in such harsh conditions. In the end, we know more about our solar system than our own planet's oceans. But through observing blue fin whales, scientists noticed by using their calls, they in turn were not just mapping the sea floor as they swam, but also that their sonar penetrated through thousands of feet beneath the sea floor, through the layers of sediment and volcanic rock that makes up the crust of our planet that got in the way of their calls. Whale calls breaking through the crust don't benefit them in any way. It's just a side effect of the strength of their calls. But scientists figured out that if we adjust our own sonar instruments, we can pick up the whale's sonar and use it to map the ocean's floor. We do not need to risk lives by sending people into the deep, dark, pressurized regions of our oceans. We just need to catch the waves when they bounce back. Such a discovery is a huge breakthrough and opens the doors to all sorts of exploratory endeavors. Imagine being able to release a trained bat into a deep cave and use its calls to map where it's flying. We could use such technology to speed up and help the mapping of regions of our planet that ground penetrating radar or satellite radar can't reach. Sadly, I fear that it could also be used for war and espionage. During the Cold War and World War II, it was not unheard of for intelligence agencies to use cats and birds to carry and exchange notes behind enemy lines, and the enemy forces would be none the wiser. And I would not be surprised if intelligence agencies has developed the technology to strap cameras onto birds or rats, but to be able to map the enemy's territory would bring a new weapon to the intelligence gathering war. I, however, do not think such a thing is unlikely to happen. You cannot go releasing a bat into a populated area and have it trained to fly overhead in circles like a bird can. There are too many variables, and besides, if we came up with this idea 40 years ago, before the invention of drones, which can be remotely piloted from thousands of miles away and see in infrared and night vision, we might have a chance at making it work. Now off that tangent and back to our oceans. There is no current explanation to why whales' calls can penetrate the Earth's crust. Last week, I said some whale calls can travel a distance of 10,000 miles 
or about 17,000 kilometers. And how sound travels faster and farther in water. But even underwater, once it hit a few layers of sediment, it would eventually start slowing down and stop once it hit hard bedrock, not to mention the damage the force would cause to the bedrock while trying to penetrate it. I'm not an expert when it comes to seismology or acoustics, aka the branch of physics which covers sound, but I would presume that either one, it would hit the bedrock and just fizzle out upon impact, or two, the sound would hit the bedrock and when it went down far enough, it would stop. But until it did, the sound with its power would break apart rock because of the friction caused by the two powers rubbing against each other, aka the bedrock's toughness and the power of the sound waves, which is not as far-fetched as one would think. Sonic drilling or using sound waves to drill is a common way to break up rocks and sediment. I'm interested to see what scientists find using this new technological development. I wonder if they can replicate it in the future and use it to map other bodies of water on other planets. Before I end this piece, I would like to go on one more quick tangent. Ever since I heard about one of Jupiter's moons, Europa, and the fact that it's covered in thick ice and underneath that ice is a moon completely made up of water hundreds of miles deeper than our own oceans, a childlike sense of wonder and fear washed over me thinking about what creatures lie beneath that ice a not-so-far-fetched concept when one finds out that it was until recently when we discovered hundreds of new species of microbes hundreds of miles beneath Antarctica in an ancient lake. Something that sounds straight out of Journey to the Center of the Earth, but without the dinosaurs. I would love to see a new generation of sonar using what we have learned from whales attached to a satellite and pointed at Europa. I hope I can hear what is beneath that thick ice in my lifetime. When it comes down to it, the best technological advancements for me are the ones we gain from learning from our fellow animals and taking what they have evolved with and honed over hundreds of millions of years to our advantage. In what one might call a selfish capitalistic 21st century world, I find that such a species cooperation and learning is heartwarming. I really cannot wait, though, to see if they're able to see parts even deeper than the Marianas Trench. I'm really looking forward to my lifetime, for it's shaping up to be quite the wild ride scientifically and technologically. Now on to our next story. Beer, wine, and alcohol. Whether used for religious ceremonies, special occasions, or celebrating one's victory in battle, our use of liquor is as old as man itself. Although the mass production and sale by major corporations is a recent thing, most major brewing and distillery companies have come along in the last 200 years. But what if I were to tell you that it dates even farther back? In the Middle Ages, it was not uncommon to have someone in town who made alcoholic beverages and sell them, but not to the scale we see today and surely not with the insane marketing we see today. For thousands of years, it was never seen in such poor light as it is today. There were no age restrictions. Royalty drank it. The Vikings celebrated with it after victory. Families drank it daily, for it was easy to get a hold of than clean water. In many cultures around the world, up until the 19th century, it was the only way for one to hydrate themselves without being poisoned by whatever contaminants or in the local water supply or the lakes or the rivers. So alcohol was more common to drink for its clean properties. Sure, there were purification techniques here and there, but they weren't as widespread. But when they became available, they were usually in the hands of nobility and the wealthy, even the lower class and the destitute to drink alcohol. The Romans, however, were famous for their aqueducts that spread for hundreds of miles, bring fresh water to populated areas. But as the Roman Empire fell and Europe became more crowded and modernized, they fell out of use and eventually stopped being used. Most water purification techniques did not really become more readily available until around the 16th century. Interestingly, perfectly lining up with the Age of Enlightenment, the Scientific Revolution, Industrial Revolution, and the introduction of many forward-thinking ideas by some of history's greatest minds. 
Now off that tangent onto the story I came to share, which is a recent discovery out of Egypt. The discovery of the world's biggest and oldest high production beer factory, dating back 3,000 years to the time of the first dynasty of Egypt, a groundbreaking kind of factory that could hold about 6,000 gallons of beer at one time. To have such a big production facility for something like beer at that period is unheard of. Once again shows the might and how advanced the Egyptian society was. Most of the ancient civilizations of the time do not show such advancements. It would not be for another 2500 years till around 3000 BCE when the Romans would build their first aqueducts and later implement aqueducts as they began to conquer Egypt and the Middle East, although most were never finished by the time the Roman Empire died out. Being that the Roman civilization was so advanced and gave birth to great architecture, literature, theater, and philosophy, there is that connection again between clean water and civilized technological development. I wonder if the Roman Empire had not died out and they were able to expand on their aqueduct system, then maybe the unhygienic, overpopulated, disease breeding ground that the Middle Age Europe became, thanks to lack of infrastructural support from nobility that helped escalate the Black Death, would not have happened at the same time to once an empire ruling the entire world. The Egyptians did also have their own form of aqueducts, but they were used to carry water to the pyramids to help in cutting the stones used in the constructions, and not for clean water to its citizens. This year has been quite the interesting year in discoveries. Not long ago, about four months back, archaeologists discovered a perfectly intact food stall underneath the soot at Vesuvius. These glimpses into the past show that our ancient ancestors were not as uncivilized or undeveloped as we generally think them to be when comparing them to humans in the modern age. It seems most of our stereotypes of the uncultured past come from the Middle Ages and the view of nobility. The ancient Romans, Egyptians, and Mesopotamians were advanced civilizations that prospered and grew for millennia. It's sad their reign had to end, but with all things it must come to an end. And with the beer discovery, it makes my brain tingle with joy and curiosity at what other things the deserts of Egypt are hiding about their civilization. I can't wait to find out. Now, on to our final story before we end. Skin cancer. These two words strike fear into most upon hearing it. For we have all had those fears at one time or another of getting it sometime in our lifetime. So we make sure we protect our skin from the UV rays of the sun with various means and methods like sunscreen, skin care, and skin checkups to make sure our skin is in good health. Because one in five Americans will get it by the time they're 70. But in a recent study, there is something you could eat to slow down and prevent UV damage. This miracle food is none other than simply grapes. When I first heard it, I kind of laughed because it sounded silly and too simple, and kind of clickbaity, you could say. Scientists from the University of Birmingham, Alabama, turned grapes into powder, and the test subjects were put on a strict regimen of three cups of powder for about two weeks. And after the study, they noticed the DNA damage caused by UV rays decreased by 70% and reversed compared to those who were given a placebo meaning that there is something in grapes that not only prevents UV damage, but also repairs the cells which the rays damage. An edible sunscreen at the molecular level of sorts, one could say. Further studies need to be done to uncover the reason for this protection, but this discovery, if not some sort of fluke, opens the door for a new line of sun protection and possible skin cancer treatment. For one could hypothesize that whatever molecule or genetic material the graves possess could be extracted or altered and made into many forms of not just skin care treatment, but cancer in general for their DNA restorative properties. It sounds like a stretch, but it is not unheard of for a gene from one species to be implanted into another. This process, which is the entire concept and method behind gene therapy, Sure, it's playing God, and it is a slippery slope, but at the end of the day, 
I think we can use this technology to find treatments for cancer. I'm all for it. It devastates too many lives. And if we could reduce the yearly cancer victims by 30%, that would be monumental. Maybe, just maybe, we are on the verge of a new wave to safely treat cancer. Well, that is all I got for this week. I would like to thank you again for joining me for another week. Do not forget to share this podcast to all those in your life who could use a scientific moment in their life. I wish you goodbye, my friends. I hope you never forget to grow and never stop searching for knowledge. And always trust your scientific nose. I hope you will all join me next week for another episode of Quandaries and Sundries. Stay safe, stay sound, stay healthy, always question your logic and reality, and do not be afraid to follow the truth. And do not forget to stay informed. Have a wonderful President's Day. This is Van Masterson, signing off.